Hello, I'm Mark Fisher, Professor of Neurology at UC Irvine and Director of the UCI Center for Neuropolitics. And I want to welcome you to our quarterly lecture presentation. Today's lecture is on the topic of liberals, conservatives, and the political brain, fMRI studies of political ideology. The presentation will address the roots of political ideology. How deep do these roots go? Is there a neurological basis for political ideology? Addressing these complex and compelling questions is a group of outstanding investigators who have published their landmark findings in PNAS Nexus. Today's speakers are Skylar Kramner, the Carter Phillips and Sue Henry Professor of Political Science at The Ohio State University and Director of the Network Independence and Social Systems Laboratory. Dr. Cranmer develops and applies statistical methods in the areas of network analysis, machine learning, and computational linguistics. He has been a visiting fellow at Harvard University's Institute for Quantitative Social Science, and his research has been supported by the National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health. We will hear from Sunny Yang, a computational social scientist who studies network theory and machine learning with applications in political neuroscience and legislative politics. She is postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Political Science and the Network Institute at Northeastern University. And this summer, she will be starting as assistant professor of political science and communication studies at Northeastern University. And we'll hear from James Wilson, Associate Professor of Statistics and Co-Director of the Data Science Program at the University of San Francisco. He has developed and taught courses in Bayesian statistics, machine learning, data science, and network analysis. His research develops new statistical and computational techniques to model, analyze, and explore high dimensional and relational data in neuroscience and political science. And we will hear from Zhonglin Liu, Chief Scientist and Associate Provost for Sciences at NYU Shanghai, where he leads the Institute of Brain and Cognitive Science. Dr. Liu was previously Distinguished Professor of Psychology, Optometry, and Translational Data Analytics at The Ohio State University. A physicist by training, Dr. Liu was assistant researcher in cognitive science right here at UC Irvine from 1992 to 1996. He then moved on to USC where he later became professor of psychology and biomedical engineering and the Keck chair in cognitive neuroscience. After the lecture by this distinguished group of speakers, Center for Neuropolitics co-director, Dr. Davin Phoenix, will lead a discussion of this presentation. And for the audience, please use the Q&A box for any questions you may have for our speakers. So now let's please welcome Drs. Cranmer, Yang, Wilson, and Liu. Great, thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate the, uh, the introduction and it's a real pleasure to be here virtually talking to everybody. Uh, so as, Mark said, today we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, functional connectivity signatures um, in the human brain that relate to political ideology. And so we should start then by talking a little bit about what political ideology actually is. And this is something that uh, political scientists have studied for quite a long time. Political scientists generally think about political ideology as a set of beliefs about the proper order of society and how it can be achieved. And that sounds a little bit nebulous, but basically what it is, is it's a framework that people use that is relatively easy to understand and can be applied to a variety of situations to help them make decisions on complex issues that they wouldn't necessarily have thought a lot about or have a lot of background knowledge on. And so political ideology is then fundamental to the way that people interact with all sorts of political issues. It's this heuristic that people use to, to see where they 
should fall on a certain issue without going too deeply into it. And in fact, ideology is multidimensional. Uh, there have been a lot of studies on this that have shown that, um, that it's at least two, if not three or four dimensional. Um, but in the United States, it tends to be very much, very much one dimensional, which is, uh, is actually rather different than the rest of the world. So that is worth, uh, worth pointing out that it's, the U.S. tends to think of things more or less strictly in terms of left and right, but that is, is not universally true of ideology. And it's not even really true of American political ideology, but that tends to be how Americans identify themselves ideologically. Um, and certainly that tends to relate strongly to how we sort ourselves into one of the two major parties that exist in this country. Um, and that is to say that the, um, the distribution of political ideology in the, the country and in the world, uh, this distribution really affects the fate of nations, um, especially in democracies where, uh, where the electorate um, appoints the government. Uh, the distribution of political ideology has a very strong influence on how countries behave. So, uh, so a lot's at stake here, and political scientists have thought about this for a long time. And in fact, there's a large literature in political science studying political ideology, but where we see a limitation to this literature is that the large, large majority of it uh, is based on surveys and based on experiments with human subjects, um, and very little of it actually looks at the human brain. Um, so we'll talk in a little bit of detail in just a moment about some of the studies that have gone into, uh, into the human brain, but the large, large majority of political sciences study of ideology is based on surveys and experiments with human subjects. And we found quite a few interesting things. Um, and the one thing that I want to highlight from that literature, because it's going to be relevant later on, is that the strongest known predictor of political ideology for an individual is actually their parents' political ideology. Uh, we tend to inherit our political ideology from our parents, and it is relatively uncommon that people end up adopting different ideologies than their parents had. So your parents' ideology tends to be the best single predictor that we have from the literature of what your political ideology will be. And as I mentioned, there haven't been very many studies in political science that have gotten into political neuroscience. Um, there have been a few from psych and a few from poli-sci, um, but this is a relatively nascent literature. And the studies that exist have been uh, really important in that they've shown that there tend to be fundamental differences in the cognitive and emotional processes that liberals and conservatives experience. Um, my colleagues are going to go into this literature uh, a little bit uh, in more detail later, but um, uh, basically what we should say now about this literature is that it is, um, it has shown the following, um, more or less, and of course I'm radically simplifying a literature, though it is a nascent literature. Um, basically what we can say about this literature is that it can be broken down into about five types of papers. Um, most of the studies that have been done so far have been done in a experimental setting um, when using fMRI or other imaging technologies. And they've used a stimulus that's designed to activate partisanship. So some sort of partisan signal, whether that's showing political images or images that relate to politics, um, that's been a primary way that the studies in this small literature have approached, uh, have approached the experimental design of looking at neuropolitics. And while this is, is really great and important for showing that there are neurological roots to politics and, um, and the brain does play a role in political decision making, the question that it leaves us with is, well, what about intrinsic connectivity patterns that aren't related to political stimuli? And that relates to the second category of literature here too, which uses experimental studies that have stimuli that are not deliberately political, but at least correlated with political processes. So some studies have shown um, people disgusting images, and those images evoke an emotional response. And the way that people respond emotionally is correlated in some ways to whether they tend to be conservative or tend to be liberal. 
Um, and so that leaves us with the same question about intrinsic patterns for stimuli that are not related to politics. Um, it's also the case that most of the existing studies use the full time series. So looking at a particular region of interest, it'll use the full time series of that, um, uh, of that region and look for changes based on the experimental stimuli, which is a really great way to identify what regions are related to po particular political processes. Um, but it is region specific. And one of the things that we want to try to do is create a more holistic approach. Uh, and also the existing literature tends to use only a single stimuli rather than a series of stimuli. Um, and one of the things that we're interested in is cross-task compatibility. So if we compare across multiple stimuli that are not necessarily related to politics, um, can we find commonality in the functional connectivity signatures in people's brains? Um, so that's one of the, uh, the primary goals of our study. And that's sort of how we see our study in relation to the existing literature. Um, and one of the things that we do do in addition is look at what specific regions are activated during this process. And that relates to a previous literature that has found um, certain regions are inherently related to political decision making, especially the insula and the anterior cingulate cortex. Uh, so we'll come back to that later. Uh, but what we see as the contribution of our design is that um, our design tries to model the brain as a complex network that gives rise to emergent political behavior. So rather than look region by region, we look at the brain holistically and look at the complex network of interconnections among the various regions within the brain. We also use stimuli that are not designed to activate partisanship. In fact, we use nine different stimuli, or rather eight stimuli uh, and the resting state, which Sunny's going to tell you about in just a second. Um, but most of these are not specifically linked to politics. Um, none of them were designed to be linked to politics. So we get the opportunity to look for these commonalities in functional connectivity signatures. Um, and like I said, we're doing a whole brain analysis across these nine tasks rather than go region by region. And we also have a novel data set that's especially large for this literature of 174 healthy subjects, which is uh, unusually large for this literature because gathering these subjects is uh, difficult and expensive. So approaching the study, we had four guiding questions in mind uh, when we sat down to design this thing. Uh, the first thing that we want to know is to what extent can functional connectivity predict political ideology? Can we predict someone's political ideology just by looking at scans of their brain? Um, and which of the nine tasks that we have are most suitable for doing this? So are some of them better predictors of ideology than others? Um, and how do they interact with one another? We're also interested in the extent that integrating these functional connectivity predictors enhances the predictability of well-established survey-based indicators. So we have this big literature in political science that has found a lot of predictors of political ideology and political behavior from surveys at the individual level. We want to know whether these things complement brain, um, uh, brain functionality or um, whether they um, are uh, contributing new information. So uh, we're interested in that and also in which brain regions contribute the most to political ideology. So those were our four guiding questions going into this. The way we do it in a nutshell is we use a network-based deep learning technique uh, to analyze functional connectivity across all of these tasks. So eight tasks as well as the resting state. And to summarize what we find, we find that we do in fact see discriminative features between liberals and conservatives. So we can do a pretty decent job predicting ideology based on functional connectivity. And um, these patterns can be fairly accurately identified using um, machine learning, which is how we approach it. We also find that a small subset of these tasks are particularly good at this, um, which is interesting and, and yields some, some food for thought that we'll get to by the end of the presentation, and also came up with a list of brain regions that are um, most related to this process. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it off to Sunny, who's going to tell you more about how we got our data and what we did with it. Thank you, Skylar.
Hello, I'm Sunny Yang. It's such a pleasure to present our co-author paper here today. So from this slide, I will explain how we collect data, description of subject in the data set, pre-processing of imaging data, and statistical models and method that we conducted for the pipeline of the prediction of the political ideology. So we use brain imaging data collected from 174 young adults from the Ohio State OSU Wellbeing Project. So these young adults are a subset of 250 participants enrolled in the Wellbeing Project. So we exclude this subject if the part of their cerebral cortex was out of field of view due to head motion during brain imaging. So each participant uh, underwent 1.5 hours of functional MRI recording, which consisted of eight tasks and resting state scans. So we use a 12-channel head, head coil on the Zeeman 3T trio MRI system with TIM in the Center for Cognitive, Cognitive and Behavioral Brain Image at the Ohio State University. So pass the slides, please. So the eight tasks aim to observe subject brain activity involved in as follows, emotional picture viewing, emotional face viewing, episodic memory encoding, episodic memory retrieval, and go-no-go -go task, monetary incentive, working memory, and the theory of mind task. So next slide, please. Then participants were also provided a series of survey-based questions, including age, gender, and their education and income. In addition, we also asked them the education income and the conservatism of their parents and the conservatism of the city where they grew up and the city where they now live. So with the exception of age and gender, these survey questions were answered on Likert scale. So using these covariates, we build predictive models for political ideology as a baseline model in order to assess the utility of functional connectivity for predicting ideology. So the outcome measure is a subject self-reported ideo ideological position on a six point Likert scale from very liberal to very conservative. Next slide, please. So here's a table showing descriptive statistics of each covariate. So around 35% of participants are male and majority of the subject are in their 20s. So we can also check the distribution of subject education, income, and religiosity with their parents' ones as well. So the table also shows the relationship between self-reported political ideology and each covariate by computing Pearson correlation and its statistical significance. So based on the correlation, we can check the subject conservatism has high, high correlation with some covariates, including male, subject father and mother's level of conservatism, parents' household income, and subject level of religiosity. Next slide, please. So in this slide, I will present how we collected brain scans and create functional connectivity. So fMRI data were first pre-processes using the minimum pre-processing human co connectum project pipeline. So the functional brain images were realigned to compensate for head motion, spatially smoothed, and normalized with a global mean. The functional images were next co-registered to the T1-weighted structural images normalize the standard, standard brain and further refine using nonlinear registration in FSL. So the minimal spatial smoothing was performed in volume space and brain images were parceled into 269 regions of interest using the automated anatomical labeling atlas. Next slide, please. 
So the bold functional activation was recorded when subjects were in resting state and performed eight emotional and cognitive tests. So the tasks associated bold activation were regressed out from the time series before connectivity analysis. Then we constructed the functional connectivity network, aka FC network, by creating matrices where each row and column represent an ROI, reasons of interest, and the value of the I, J, entry of the matrix is the correlation coefficient between the I and J brain region from the time series of the averaged bold signals. But we exclude the 252 ROI because it had all missing value in the time series of the average bold signal. So we we only used 269, 68 uh, time series. So we create uh, 268 times 268 symmetric matrix. So we created these matrices for each participant and each task. So there are nine matrices per participant. So one matrix for each of the nine tasks. So each this each uh, functional connectivity matrix is represented as a full symmetric matrix with zeros along the diagonal and off diagonal terms are between minus one and one. So from this slide, I will explain the framework of our statistical analysis. So BrainNet CNN is used to make predictions of political ideology from brain network. So BrainNet CNN is a convolutional neural network framework to predict clinical neurodevelopmental outcomes from a brain network. So brain, BrainNet CNN has multiple convolutional filter layers of a particular shape designed to capture topological locality in the brain. So for each task T and individual K, so BrainNet, BrainNet CNN produces the continuous scores of political ideology using this functional connectivity matrix as input. So to evaluate our predicted power, we measure the Pearson correlation coefficient between the predicted values and the true political ideology and test its significance. Then we conduct the principal component analysis to determine the dimension of the predicted political ideology. So we also investigated the extent to which the predicted ideology scores could be used to classify a dichotomized outcome. So here, so we created two dichotomized outcome. The first one is conservative. Conservative include very conservative, somewhat conservative, and conservative. And liberal outcome contains very liberal, somewhat liberal, and liberal. So we fit the logistic regression model to predict that individuals dichotomize political ideology using the predicted uh, ideology scores from BrainNet CNN as independent variable. So now this, this is called the FC model I, in the later. So we compare this FC model with other logistic regression model with different combination of variable, including age, gender, education, income, and a subject parent political ideology. So for, for detailed analysis, so we did some Monte Carlo cross-validation for comparing the models. So each task set for each sample were chosen at random and contained the randomly chosen proportion of the total population of observation with proportion between 0 0.05 and 0 0.5. And then using the deconvolutional network, uh, we explore which brain connections were the most predictive of political ideology score. So the convolutional network is the convolutional neural network that work in a reverse process. 
So they produce the partial derivative matrices whose magnitude represent which brain features were used most when predicting the outcome. So based on these partial derivative matrices, we have the weighted the degree centrality of brain regions as a measure of importance for the prediction. So for better visualization, so 200, 268 region of interest were aligned with the same anatomical structures in an anatomical automated anatomical labeling AAL atlas. So after averaging the weighted degree centrality, we created the final 78 brain regions and visualized them. So next, uh, James will explain our findings. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you so much, Mark, for the invitation and for having us here. It's, uh, this is the first time I've given a joint talk in quite some time, uh, <laughs> since some teaching, uh, kind of joint teaching a long time ago, but this is really exciting and it's, it's an honor to be here. So I get to dive into the data now. Um, so thank you, Sonny and, and Skylar for setting up um, setting up our what we're now going to start exploring. And so the first part of what we did in this study, so you know we're motivated by those um, major four questions uh, that Skylar mentioned. And we had heard of and knew about kind of recent convolutional neural networks that have been used for brain imaging. And so our, our workhorse really upfront was using BrainNet CNN. And so the idea there was to get a, an understanding of what can we measure based on these images. Uh, so these functional images that we have for each task, what can we actually say about political ideology? So we took, um, we took the actual ideology scores. So just a one dimensional representation of what each one of these uh, individuals look like politically. And first just said, well, how, how well do these actually correlate with the true political ideology? And this is an overview of the results that we found. And then I'll show you a really uh, quite a large plot in a second that's in our, that's in our uh, study, but it's interesting to look at this. The, the key thing to, to see, I think, up front um, is the fact that actually it seemed like all of these uh, tasks, even though they weren't planned for political ideology, were in some sense pretty strongly correlated with ideology itself. So if we just look at this across the board, so for extreme as well as um, as well as moderate ideology, there was some correlation and we'll see that in a moment. But um, interestingly enough, so you know when we when we take into account actually splitting this into extreme versus moderate ideology, then what we really find is that the reward task was the most associated with extreme views. Uh, so extreme views being only those that that considered themselves or reported themselves to be um, extremely liberal or extremely conservative, and moderate ideology being everything else in between. And when we look at moderate ideology, it turns out that empathy was the primary or, or was the only one, um, only task associated with moderate ideology. When we look at overall ideology, and these are all being corrected for using Bonferroni um, multiple comparisons. Uh, we have that affect, empathy, reward, and go, no, go were all strongly associated with ideology itself. And so all of these were um, correlated with one another in overall ideology prediction, but all but one pair of tasks, so empathy and retrieval, were strongly correlated across their moderate ideology uh, prediction. So let's let's go to the next plot and I'll, I'll explain this a little bit better. So as I said, this is uh, there's so many different tasks that we're looking at. It's hard to put this all in one picture. But what I want you to think about here is on the on the um, axes, we're doing a pairwise scatter plot where basically in the first column and first row, we have the actual ideology itself. And that can be broken up into the, the red distribution of extreme views, as well as the blue distribution here of moderate views. And along the other columns and rows are actually the scores that we get from BrainNet CNN associated with each one of these tasks. So if we're looking at the first column, we see affect, for example, uh, and then go down. Um, if we go down now, affect down to the, uh, the first scatter plot that we see, then you'll see that's actually a relationship between affect and empathy. And if we want to look at the relationship between affect and ideology, um, then what we're going to end up doing, let's see, uh, on extremity is actually look at this in terms of their box plots um, at the end. So you can look at the last column here. Uh, as far as extremity for each one of these 
uh, values, or you can look along the actual distributions and how these things separate. So within the numbers that you see here that are quite small on the picture, and I apologize for that, um, is the fact that we have correlation in black. So this is just of overall ideology. And then we have extreme ideology. Um, so how correlated are the values um, between affect, brain net CNN results, as well as the actual extreme views. Um, and then the blue is now moderate. And so when you correct for these things for Bonferroni, then we see what we had found before, that in fact, it was empathy that really seemed to be the only one that stood out uh, for moderate views. And reward um, was very closely associated with extreme. So there's a lot to digest in this picture, but it's an interesting thing to kind of take apart. And I, I think the key up front is that we see quite a bit of a relationship. You know, there's there's strong associations between what's happening with uh, what we can find in features of each of these tasks. And we'd like to break that down a little bit further. So if we go to the next slide. So the statistician in me um, says, okay, so we see pretty reasonable relationships. You know, we can assess uh, statistical significance of which ones, which tasks are strongly associated. Um, and so we see reasonably strong associations among these tasks. So what else can we do to better understand ideology and, and the tasks that we have? So we decide to use PCA here. So principal component analysis. And really what that's going to allow us to do is to break down the variability in the political ideology scores that we get from each task. So what you can imagine is that we have now, in, uh, we have a matrix which contains the political ideology scores across every task that we considered and every individual in the study. And so with that, what we'd like to know is how much of the variability in these scores are actually explained um, explained by the first PC, for example, or the top five PCs. And in particular, we'd like to know what is the dimension of variability in this data? And what that allows us to know is how associated are all of these different tasks. You know, if we, uh, and just as an example, um, if we were to run PCA and find that indeed only one principal component explains all of the variability, what that's really getting at is that all of these tasks are telling us overlapping information. On the other hand, if we found that nine PCs, because there were nine tasks overall, eight tasks in resting state, uh, if the PCs, um, we needed nine PCs to really explain the variability in the data, then that would say that these indeed were mostly disjoint pieces of information from each task. So really what PCA is allowing us to do is to understand what is the commonality in each one of these tasks? Uh, how much overlap is there? And you know how many, in general, how many dimensions of these tasks do we actually need? So what we find by, the, um, in keeping that in mind, what we actually find is that it turns out that um, the top five components explain roughly 80% of the variability. And so it's kind of a, you know, it's a little bit of a heuristic to use 80%, but that's generally, you know, a, a nice a, a nice value here for understanding uh, variability in a system. And so thinking about the top five components is really saying among these nine different tasks, there's really five kind of non-overlapping dimensions that tell us about political ideology. And that would be really interesting to explore further of like, how can we get to those five, right? Um, some other things that we learned though, are actually with the first principal component. So if we just look at the first one, the dimension of most variability, uh, it's approximately 42.5% of the total variability in these scores are explained by the first um, dimension. And in that dimension, it turns out that each of these tasks uh, are equally contributing or roughly equally contributing, uh, at least statistically so. And then two through five, so we actually see with principal components two through five, um, they're dictated by two or three tasks. So as an, um, in particular, we see for PC2, resting state and encoding are the primary contributors. Uh, PC3 is retrieval and resting state. PC4 is go, no, go and theory of mind. And PC5 is empathy, reward and theory of mind. And so the thing to keep in mind here, here is as we go further into the principal components, uh, we're explaining less and less variability, right? So the the higher, um, the the first PC explains the most variability, and then the second, the next most. Uh, and so it's interesting to see which ones contribute. And so we have a table of this in the next slide. And so you can see on the on the left here is a scree plot that shows uh, the percentage of variability explained by each one of these nine dimensions um, calculated by PCA. 
And then furthermore, if we just look at on the right-hand side, this is a by plot uh, showing the first dimension. So we're just plotting now um, the actual PC itself. So what I should point out is the X and Y axis shouldn't matter to you very much. It's the relationship of where these points lie. Um, so these are actually the values of the PCs themselves. And we're mapping the first dimension, which is the most variability explained against the second dimension to see how well separated are conservatives and liberals, right? According to their ideology. And amazingly enough, there's really strong clustering here. You know, I, I like this picture because it really does show even among the first two dimensions, when you're only considering about 50% of the variability explained by these different tasks, we could still still see quite a bit of separation among conservatives and liberals. So it's really motivating uh, to see these uh, these statements that we've made and to kind of further understand how can we get at, you know, best get at actually what these two dimensions are. Okay. And so now this is... Um, further expounding upon the principal components. So this is now, we can break down each um, principal component, so PC1 through PC5, and understand as a, as a percentage contribution, how much is each one of these tasks contributing to these PCs? Um, and so I, I had mentioned this before in kind of the overview, but you can see the PC1 is roughly, they're equally, um, they're equally contributing to PC1, so the direction of most variability. Resting state is a little bit lower than the rest, but not statistically so. Uh, in PC2, it's it's quite different. Um, encoding and resting state are actually the primary contributors to that uh, principal component, saying that whatever it was that the first principal component did not capture, it certainly seems that encoding and resting state in the next dimension captured the most variability. And you can think of that as we go through the remaining uh, PCs. So that is, uh, you know, as a as someone walking through this data, it's such an interesting and rich data set uh, that there were a lot of things that we could imagine doing um, from a statistical point of view. Uh, and I think there's many more that we could still consider doing um, that would be exciting to, to think about. Uh, but the first, you know, our first main aim was really just to understand, does this BrainNet CNN methodology coupled on top of just looking at these different tasks actually tell us anything about um, or are there any associations between these different uh, tasks and relationships? The next step is really then to, to take that further and say, well, let's let's actually treat this as a in a um, predictive format. So now imagine that our goal is to take these nine tasks or any of these nine tasks and say, let's now predict whether or not this person that we have under the scanner has a um, is more liberal leaning or more conservative leaning. And so the next, that question can be looked at using cross-validation and a predictive model. And here we used, um, our, I believe it was random forest. I have to go back to that. I believe it was a random forest model um, to identify what the, or to make these predictions. And what you see here are two different metrics um, that we're looking at. So first is predictive AUC, which are represented by the bar, bar plots that we see. And then second to the left of that is a column of the actual accuracy of the model. And so I've ordered these in such a way that we can we can see, I've, I've broken them down into different uh, forms of models. So what we actually did here was take each task by itself. So the scores that we get from those tasks and say, how well can that actually predict ideology? So we did that with resting uh, the resting task through all nine other tasks. And then furthermore, we took um, some uh, model which contained all of the survey, uh, all of the survey questions that that uh, Sonny had mentioned earlier, as well. I mean, without parent conservatism, because we know that the conservatism of your parents were the most related um, based on our correlation results, and so we looked at just survey without par uh, parental conservatism. We also looked at a model just with all of the functional connectivity tasks, um, and then we looked at a parent conservatism model by itself, and in fact. We labeled that as kind of the benchmark model uh, based on previous studies, as well as our own findings, uh, just looking at basic correlations that indeed um, it is more often, uh, or it's a very strong predictor. We know that the, your parents' conservatism is a very strong predictor of your own conservatism. And so we treated that as our benchmark model to see, can functional connectivity actually tell us more or augment the information that we get from this conservatism? And I think what's interesting is, is a couple of things. So 
when we're looking at the the middle uh, bars here, so kind of the grayish bars here, um, those all of these models are statistically indistinguishable from the parent kind of benchmark model that we're looking at. So what that means is in general, if you take parent conservatism to be the most, and understand that to be the most predictive, um, when we look at just using the affect task or just the retrieval task or just the empathy or just the reward task, it in fact turns out that each of these tasks give us statistically the same predictive ability of, uh, of ideology as using one's uh, parental conservatism. So that was already interesting by itself. So just using each one of these tasks separately, we can actually get as strong of a predictive model. Um, similarly, using all of the survey information without parental conservatism gives us a similar, um, <clears throat> a similar achieving model, as well as using all FC tasks. But now I think what's even more interesting than this is that once we go beyond that and actually say, well, let's let's try to make it better. So how can we actually outperform this uh, parental conservatism model? And when you add in the functional connectivity tasks, uh, so all of the functional connectivity tasks to parental conservatism, we see that we do indeed get a better model predictively. And this doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Um, so folks interested in data science and machine learning, there's a classic issue of overfitting. When you add in too many variables, then suddenly you uh, get to this issue of worse predictive power. Um, that turned out not to be the case. Uh, and so this is really compelling evidence that we find that functional connectivity is adding to our understanding of what our parents' conservatism gives us um, as a predictor for your own ideology. And similarly, if you look at all survey, so that was also a, um, a stronger model. So just using all of the survey information we have plus conservatism, and indeed all survey plus all FC tasks were the best, was the best model. Um, but these three models all were statistically equal to one another and better than the benchmark model we were looking at. Great, so next slide. All right, so we've kind of done a little bit of exploratory analysis, understanding associations um, and relationships at uh, from a correlation and association way uh, strategy, but then also through um, understanding the dimension of variability with PCA, um, we now understand that indeed there are certain tasks that can give us um, as as good of predictive accuracies as um, as parental conservatism, and even better is that the fact that using tasks in addition to that information gives us a better model. Um, so the next thing we wanna do is really dive down into variable importance. So understanding which of these tasks actually are the most important to identifying um, or distinguishing between political ideology. And to do that, we use an L1 uh, penalized logistic regression model. So sometimes called the logistic lasso model. Um, and the idea there is to say fit, you know, Put all of our our I'll put all of our covariates in. So all the survey information, including parental conservatism, uh, as well as the information we get from tasks, um, into the model, and then determine importance via um, lasso. So here we're going to actually calculate the importance of a value based on the lasso coefficients that are provided. And what we end up finding is that indeed we find from this lasso model that parental variables are important. Um, three of the nine tasks were particularly important uh, from this model. And they uh, and those were empathy, retrieval, and reward tasks. And that indeed they had, they had higher importance than the parental conservatism itself. And so together, all of these, these analyses, so it should be pointed out that variable importance using something like Lasso is quite a separate, um, is, a, is a separate analysis from running this prediction analysis that we had in the previous slide and can't be guaranteed to give you the same results. Uh, and in fact, it's very often the case that it does not. Here we're finding very consistent evidence of, uh, of these three empathy, retrieval, and reward tasks that seem to come out on top. So to the next slide. And this is a, a table kind of showing the importance value, which is rated between zero and one. So importance between zero and one here in the first column. Um, and we see that indeed empathy, retrieval, and reward were all higher than any of the survey questions. Um, we get also the coefficient of the fitted model and the p-value associated with those coefficients. And so here, if you look at the fitted, fitted model based on the coefficients, we find that mother's conservatism and empathy were the two 
um, uh, statistically significant variables in the fitted model. Um, but importance wise, we actually find the tasks have more importance than these other survey model uh, variables. And I think with that, I'm going to pass it on to Zong Lin to talk more about uh, the inner workings of the brain and how these results associated with it. So thank you. Uh, let me first thank Mark for inviting me to be part of the team to present today. Uh, as he said, I was a UC Irvine for four years, and but I was in Irvine for 20 years before I, I went to OSU. Uh, so I still have many close friends and collaborators at UCI. So I feel really uh, interesting to give a talk at UC Irvine today. Uh, before I present my part, I want to say something about the Ohio Wellbeing Project. Uh, the project was really designed by Will Cunningham, uh, who was the Associate Director of uh, Center for Cognitive and Behavioral Brain Imaging uh, for one year when I joined OSU and when I was setting up the center. He and I designed the study to actually study social, emotional, and cognitive processes. Uh, in a big population. So we collect, designed the study to collect data from uh, college kids, mostly freshmen class at OSU. The goal was to track them for four years. And in addition to the imaging data and the demographic data you see today, we also have about two hours of uh, performance data, county performance data and so on. So there have been many, many studies, uh, publications from the project. And the person who did most of the heavy lifting data collection was uh, Shan Ray Li. He was the engineer in the, in the center. And I want to acknowledge both of their contributions today before I start. So uh, <clears throat> as my co-authors have presented so far, uh, we have generated very interesting predictive models uh, from deep learning based on uh, functional connectivity. Here, I'm going to uh, turn to another question, which is what are the contributions from this uh, uh, brain regions? What brain regions are important? Or what connectivities are important? So previously, Cox and uh, Newman, Nolan exam functional con connectivity patterns in resting state, when subject will close their eyes, they would not do anything, they scan uh, the brain and they look at functional connectivity, they find that political liberalism is associated with tighter communication between the dorsal anterior cingular cortex, which is very important for emotion processing, and the right insular, which is mostly responsible for conflict monitoring. And Kim et al. find that connectivity between the orbital frontal cortex, OFC, and precuneus, as well as between the insular and frontal pole and OFC, were particularly prominent in conservatives under stimuli designed to evoke anxiety. This is task FMI. This is, as Skyler said in the beginning, we show people stimuli that evoke anxiety. And in that condition, they can examine this. And Ann and the men that find that the function of the right amygdala hippocampus inferior part whoops, of the opicular <laughs> frontal gyrus and the ACG are tied to political conservatism. The right uh, F FG is involved in risk aversion and ACG is associated with political liberalism. Again, these are functional FMI studies based on tasks where people are performing certain kind of tasks uh, in the kind of typically emotional tasks that people are uh, processing. And so these results, a lot of these results show that, you know, they can identify certain regions or connectivities that could be important for uh, predicting political ideology. What about our results? So next slide, please. So to identify uh, predictive brain regions from our analysis, uh, <clears throat> we investigate which brain regions are most predictive of political orientation across tasks using a technology called deep learning inside network technique. Uh, so the DNT technique quantifies the degree to which an edge between two regions is associated with prediction of political ideology and is computed as average partial derivative of the predicted political ideology with respect to the input edge. So 
the point really is this. So we have this uh, 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 deep learning network. It makes a prediction of political ideology. That's output. Then we have like, you know, 268 pairs of connect connections in this. And what we do is basically take derivative of the uh, ideology prediction with regard to each edge, essentially. And then we can add up the, the derivatives uh, of a particular edge, of a particular node in the brain and find the, the large, uh, the, re the, the brain regions that, was, that has large, uh, some derivatives, and we identify those as important uh, regions. And please, next slide. So this is a, a illustration, as uh, Sunny said earlier, that you know of all the important brain regions uh, in these three different tasks that are very important for uh, predicting uh, political ideology. Uh, it will take me three hours to go over all the <laughs> names and labels in this. So I'm going to skip this. I'm just going to say that, give you one example, like in reward task, the connection between the right insular uh, and the right uh, codate <clears throat> is very important for predicting uh, predict uh, for, sorry, for uh, liberalism uh, in, in, in this. And the connection between the right uh, inferior temporal gyrus and the, the left uh, superior uh, uh, occipital gyrus is very important for uh, conservatism. So you can look at all this, you look at our paper. In fact, we, said we have a table in the next slide that lists all the most important connections uh, for this prediction uh, in all these nine different I should say eight tasks and the rest in state. Uh, so I'm not going to go over all these things. If you want to know the names of these regions, uh, you can find the, like a cheat sheet on uh, on the internet. And oftentimes the cheat sheet will tell you what each region typically is responsible for. Like the insular, as I said earlier, is responsible for conflict uh, monitoring, for example, like this. Uh, uh, ITG is important for memory and uh, like SOG is important for complex visual processing and, and so on and so forth. And, and so one can get a, a better appreciation of this table if you have a cheat sheet with you. So uh, please to go to the next slide. So what we find is that the, the left hippocampus, which is uh, important for short-term memory and spatial perception, uh, the left middle part of orbital uh, frontal gyrus, which is important in decision making and emotion processing, and the right amygdala, which is also important for emotion processing, are the most predictive of political ideology in the three most predictive tasks, like uh, James said earlier, reward, retrieval, and empathy tasks. Uh, the left <clears throat> middle part of orbital frontal Jairus is a particularly strong predictor in all three of these tasks, uh, which again, I said, you know, orbital frontal gyrus is very important in decision-making and also in emotion uh, processing. Uh, inferential regions from the retrieval and emphasis tasks show significant overlap with those identified by the reward tasks, including the left and right amygdala, really important for uh, emotion processing and the right ACG, uh, anterior uh, singular co uh, cortex. Uh, co cortex. Uh, inferential regions from the reward task tends to be much more widely distributed. The right inferior gyrus, the right uh, canals, <coughs> uh, the left inferior <coughs> occipital lobe, and the left and right uh, IFG are highly inferential brain regions for political ideology prediction. These findings are quite consistent with previous work I cited earlier in the beginning of my section, who identified relationships of the Mikna hippocampus, uh, IFG, and ACG with political ideology, so task based stimuli. Again, in those studies, they use tasks in which people are processing emotional stimuli or making decisions and, and so on. And well, in this study, we are only looking at rising state in a sense that. 
I should say that even when people are performing tasks in this study, we regress out. Remember, Sunny said that we regress out the FMI activations that are associated with task performance in this study. And I think that's me to uh, to finish it up. So, um, so thanks everybody so far. Um, basically, I uh, just want to wrap things up now to kind of highlight our key findings. Uh, the main finding that that we have is that we notice discriminative features among liberals and conservatives based on their functional connectivity patterns. That, uh, as my colleagues have have mentioned, uh, empathy, reward, retrieval. These are the most common. Um, uh, or these are fairly common fMRI tasks that we have found to yield pretty strong predictions. Uh, what's very interesting, I think, is that all of the tasks were actually correlated to ideology um, in some way. And so what this suggests is that the, um, the functional connectivity signatures of political ideology persist across these tasks and across resting state. And that is particularly important because, uh, well, as one of the uh, the questions in the, the Q&A says, um, why, is, why is brain imaging important for predicting ideology? Well, we're not really trying to predict ideology with the highest accuracy we can. We're trying to understand the extent to which political ideology has neurological roots. And so the fact that we see um, the signatures of of political ideology dispersed across these nine tasks, uh, including the resting state, and all of these with stimuli that were not designed to evoke political partisanship, that indicates that there is a, a substantial degree, perhaps, of neurological underpinnings to political ideology. Um, and so that's that's really what what we thought was an exciting finding. Um, and the main thing that we were going for with this entire approach is to understand how much of that is actually related to the brain. Um, and so, um, so it's interesting that we can improve predictive performance when we include functional connectivity with the survey instruments, um, but also do pretty well on our own. So just brain scanning does relatively well. And, um, uh, we can do even better when we include the features from common survey items. And what that suggests is that there's an extent to which these um, the sources of information coming from the brain and from the survey responses are complementary to one another. So they're not just capturing the same thing in a different way. They're actually um, introducing new information. Um, so for example, we get about a 10% AUC boost over the benchmark when we uh, do the full model with all of the survey-based predictors and all of the functional connectivity predictors. Um, uh, and we were able to characterize uh, which brain regions are most strongly associated with ideology. Um, to, to recap a few more of the findings, uh, we found that reward was the main task that was predictive of extreme political views, so extreme left or extreme right, so just extremism in general. And this is uh, partially supporting uh, findings from Schreiber et al. Um, back in 2013, who found that there was a bold response from a risky gains reward task that had a predictive um, uh, AUC of 0.82. Um, when uh, applied to political ideology, and it also complements a more recent study that found that um, a reward sensitivity is implicated in the ideological process. Uh, we also found that when trying to predict moderate I ideology, so anything other than very conservative or very liberal, empathy was the primary task that was, uh, that was useful for doing that. And the implication here is that it, uh, it suggests that political thought uh, may be tied to emotion um, and emotional responses. And this is a, a finding that's also supported by Anadol, um, who found that showing participants disgusting images in an affect task uh, was predictive of political ideology. And lastly, we should conclude by discussing some of the limitations of our study, because uh, but as we all know in science, nothing is perfect, um, and this isn't either. So, uh, so there are some limitations to our study that uh, that we want to be upfront about. Um, the first is that functional connectivity doesn't imply a causal re relationship between two brain regions. Um, so, specifically, the experimental setup that um, that one is using in the task 
um, that can cause a correlation between two brain regions um, that don't even share uh, white matter tracts. It is possible that that can happen. Um, and we've done our best to minimize that possibility uh, by regressing out the task-associated activations, as both Sunny and Zonglin talked about. Uh, so we, we've tried to do our best to deal with that, but that is a issue whenever dealing with functional connectivity. Um, our results uh, do suggest that the predictive ability of each task is distinct and potentially complementary um, to the others, which is, uh, I think, a good thing. Um, but we think that future research should investigate possible mediators of these relationships, um, including uh, physical white matter connections, um, may very well be a mediator to these functional connectivity connections. Um, to wrap up the limitations, um, there is a skew in partisanship in our sample. Uh, so the participants were primarily university students uh, who tend to be more liberal than conservative, even in Ohio. Um, and so there was a, um, a skew in the number of participants who identify as liberal. Um, we, we had 49 identifying um, on the conservative side and 125 identifying on the liberal side, um, which we uh, attempted to correct in our analysis, but, uh, but there was a skew issue. Um, potentially a bigger issue is that the number of extreme conservatives was quite small in our study. Um, so we looked at extremism on the left and the right, um, but we had very few extremists on the right. Um, uh, we addressed this with cross-validation, but we definitely think that further study on extreme political views compared to moderate political uh, views is warranted and would actually yield um, probably really interesting findings, especially how people migrate towards extremism. But that is a, a talk for a different day with data that I don't have. So, um, uh, so that's a limitation as it stands right now. Um, it's also a limitation that our study is on the young side. So most of the participants were in their 20s and none of them were older than 40. Uh, so um, these results may not hold with very young people or very old people, meaning over 40, and I guess I count myself among those, ouch. Uh, so yeah, um, there's that. And also um, uh, these are observational data um, in the sense that they were not randomized according to ideology, because when the data were gathered, the, the primary goal of the well-being study, as, as Zong Lin described it, was not to study partisanship. This was a kind of a, a happy accident in terms of the things that they gathered and we were able to use. Um, and then lastly, the uh, what I think of as, as the primary limitation of this study and really the the cause for further research and, and uh, what I hope we and, and others can do down the line is uh, to really parse out the direction of causality here. Because what we've shown is an association between functional connectivity patterns and ideology, but it's not clear whether one's functional connectivity patterns present this way because of an ideology you've chosen or because you choose your ideology because of your functional connectivity patterns. So we don't know uh, which is which. Uh, what we've only been able to show is that there is a relationship between them. And parsing that out would be, uh, I think, an important discovery, something that I hope someone uh, can address down the line. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure talking to everybody today. I look forward to, uh, to hearing your thoughts on the paper. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for that wonderful, very intriguing uh, presentation of this project. Uh, my name is Devin Phoenix. I'm Associate Professor of Political Science here at UCI and I'm co-director of the Center for Neuropolitics. I'll be moderating the discussion. So we've got a lot of questions. So um, pose those questions to you and you can adjust them in any way you want. Um, and I might adapt or add my own um, additional points on the questions. The first question we got from Jody, uh, you largely addressed uh, Skyler and kind of in those limitations, thinking about how the youth of the sample might affect the results. Um, so I want to uh, ask if you all have any thoughts. So Jody asked specifically, what might be the results if you're able to check or conduct these tests on parents and children as pairs? Do you have any thoughts on how um, doing such a test if you had the opportunity, or even just looking at different age cohorts might signify something that might be 
a bit different or help think about even the causality question? Uh, well, I think it would definitely be interesting. Um, what what I think would be more powerful, um, and, and so, so if I have uh, uh, my wish as to what data we had, it would be really longitudinal data that tracks someone's partisanship from childhood um, through young adulthood, which is what we're mostly capturing here, into mature adulthood. Uh, that would be very interesting data to have, but that's a big longitudinal study, uh, which we don't. And that would definitely help us parse out the um, uh, the direction of causality issue uh, if we had this sort of longitudinal data. I don't know if anyone else wants to take a, a crack at that one. If not... I'll ask uh, one of Akoska's uh, questions. So you addressed uh, her second question um, about, you know, not necessarily looking to predict, but looking to just look for the correlation to understand how uh, ideology might be a function of uh, brain functional connectivity. But I'll ask her other question, um, which you also kind of addressed in thinking about you're not seeking to make predictions, but what is the potential for a fatalistic account, right? As we continue to explore uh, the brain's role in shaping ideology. Um, how can you engage in this work without kind of falling into determinism or saying, you know, people are just kind of automatons, I guess? Uh, I think that's a really good question. Um, and in my view, that really depends on the answer to this causality question that, that we don't have the answer to. So if if it is the case that we choose our partisanship because of our, um, our functional connectivity structures, that has interesting and, and worrisome implications in, in terms of, uh, of determinism, as you were saying. If on the other hand, um, we choose our ideology and then our functional connectivity structures um, form around it, that's more in line with the narrative of ideology being a heuristic, right? So once you adapt the heuristic in terms of this, this simplified way of viewing complex issues uh, that, that help us make sense of a complex world, then um, that, that certainly isn't a problem in terms of determinism, right? That's, that's then a choice that someone makes and their brain adapts around it. But we, again, we don't know the direction of causality, so it would be hard to say anything definitive based on the data that we have. So maybe I should add a point to this. I think the brain connectivity changes over time. It's not a fixed thing. Like, you know, you have brain connectivity, you're born with and you have it for, the, for your life. So probably ideology also changes over time. And I think brain connectivity may also change. Now, this doesn't imply that they, they have causality there, but I'm just saying that, uh, yeah, even if you think about the extreme case of deterministic uh, brain uh, on ideology, you still have to think that uh, the, you know, both of them changes over time. Yeah. Thank you, that's really helpful additional context. Hale asked, I wanted to talk about the tasks, right? Noting that you found the reward task was more associated with extreme ideology while empathy was associated with moderate ideology. Seems like is pushing back a little bit or thinking through empathy generally being a difference maker, the possession of empathy or not, uh, determining whether someone is more extreme in their views. I'm thinking maybe specifically uh, how we might conceptualize extreme conservatism, right? Extreme kind of uh, support for policies that might not be helpful to our group. So maybe you can talk a little bit about the tasks themselves. What was the reward task entailing? What was the empathy task entailing? How we might think about empathy in our kind of substantive sense of its connection to theology. Zonglin or Sunny, do you want you to want to take that? I need to go back to the table. Yeah. <laughs> Sunny, you what guys are the data Zonglin. <laughs> so I, I want to say first that I want to emphasize that uh, we have taken away the activations associated with reward or empathy. That means that when people have response, right, reward response or empathy, they have some changes in the FMI responses. We've regressed those things out. 
So what we have left when we do this functional connectivity analysis is you, if you think you think about it, it's more like the context within which people are performing that task, not the task itself, but more like, you know, when they're performing the task, you know, the whole brain may have some state changes uh, in some ways. So that, that's, that's one point I want to point out. It's not like this is related to the task itself. Uh, I think the, the reward task in this case is basically, you tell people, you know, uh, there is a reward coming. You have to wait. So you can click a button now to get a reward or you can wait, uh, collect a reward at a later point of time. So it's a very simple task. You know, it's like you're, you're betting your, your money, right? You say, you know, if you wait longer, you make it more. If you wait shorter, you get less and stuff like this. The emphasis task basically will show people pictures of, uh, you know, some kind of uh, bad events. And we want to evoke some kind of emphasis in people's mind. And this, these are the two kinds of tasks. Again, the activations associated with this task were removed in the regression. And it's more like the context of this uh, connectivity in that, that, that uh, might be different, yeah. That's very helpful. So it's not about the outcome of their activity, but what brain areas are simulated, whatever they, their outcome is as they complete. Right, right. That's very it's not associated with the outcome of the, the right. task. Yeah. So it's not like more empathetic people are doing this versus less empathetic right. people. Everyone, regardless of where they end up, what's the brain activities, what's the brain areas? That's very helpful. Um, and what I'll ask, do liberals have healthier brain connectivity states compared to conservatives? Now, that's an interesting question. What do you mean by healthier? Right, that is a question. Maybe you want to follow up. <laughs> <laughs> we can come back to that and see. Um, Lewitt was curious about kind of the priming. So are the subjects asked to state their ideology before or after the imaging? Thinking specifically, right? Um, if they've stated that, might there be some priming effect that might now shape the brain activity, the functional connectivity in the test or the tasks? Typically, they, they have done this uh, service before the imaging session, typically. Um, I wouldn't say it's strict but some people may have done this uh, questionnaires afterwards. But this is like not right before, it's like a few days before they go to the scanner. Right. And all these tasks have nothing to do with political ideology. Right. They, nobody knew we we're asking anything about political art, uh, ideology in the FMI sessions. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to do emotion, emotion and, and cognitive tasks in the, in the scanner. Right. So that would mitigate any potential concerns of priming or bias in that survey questionnaire that they're not explicitly tied to politics or ideology of the tasks. Which you're right. Right. I see that Catherine asked how you define a conservative, but it's basically just the strict ideology self-report, strong liberal to strong conservative. So really that's in the eye of the beholder. Um, yeah, you know, self-reports person... on a seven point Likert scale. Yes. The tr traditional, um, you know, I was curious, you talked about the kind of age and gender distribution. Was there any racial ethnic variation in that sample? So unfortunately, we did not ask the ethnicity information to subjects. So yeah, it would be uh, greatly, I mean, it would be really interesting if we, we can also examine the relationship between the ethnicity, political ideology, and other types of like a demographic information. So, but unfortunately we did not collect, we did not ask the ethnicity of the subject. Right, sure. And I'm curious uh, what variation might yield because there's work from uh, Kim Jefferson at Stanford and some other political scientists that notes uh, people of color tend to have very different interpretations of standard ideology questions to the point that a person color's response to that Likert scale question is going to mean something very substantially different, and it doesn't map onto their political preferences in the way we would expect it to. So, that'd be some interest in there. Um, I see uh, Dr. Crowley notes um, the value of longitudinal data, but emphasizes the challenge, right, of implementing it. Um, they also ask about um, can you reward on the uh, elaborate on the reward, but I think. Um, Dr. Lee spoke about that and talking about the reward and empathy tasks. And so Dr. Crowley, if you'd like to hear more, um, you can follow up. Um, I'm gonna read through these newest questions. Um, 
So if you all can see Darren's uh, comment here, looks like Darren's making a connection to um, data that they've been able to look at. And I'm trying to quickly read through. So I'll just read, uh, I think, some of the key portions. The comparisons with parental conservatism are particularly noteworthy and interesting to think about with the causality issue. Um, when you're predicting the parental, when you're out predicting parental conservatism, it's fascinating to think about how we all share these genes, but a lot of our socialization with our parents, you're still out predicting your parental conservatism data. I was wondering about that too. Um, is there even a potentially endogeneity between kind of not just the parents' conservatism, but right, kind of how they've socialized the child being reflected in those functional connectivity patterns. Um, but I don't think that's Darren's question. I think that's my question. Uh, if you have thoughts on that, uh, feel free to weigh in. Uh, but he goes on to say, when I looked at our data with the red brain, blue brain paper, I found that our predictive power with the brain emission data was better than we expect, given twin studies and heritability studies. Again, my intuition is that this points against the causal direction being from biology to politics. Okay, so thinking about potential weighing in on the causality, uh, the direction of causality. I don't know if anyone had any just thoughts on that, those thoughts. Um, yeah, thanks, Darren. That's, um, that's a really uh, interesting way to think about it. And I've, as we were developing this study, we thought sometimes about this, uh, this burgeoning literature on genopolitics and, and basically see this study as complementary to that literature in a lot of ways. Uh, because it's looking for potential biological roots in politics. Um, but yeah, parsing out that causal direction is is difficult. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate the the feedback on on what that might suggest. but um, but I think we're uh, we and the field as a whole are a ways away from being able to show that in a really robust way. Um, but it provides a, uh, an interesting avenue for exploration. Uh, Brenda, thanks you for an amazing talk and really keyed in on your mention at the end of white matter connectivity. Do you have any upcoming studies looking at white matter uh, tractography using diffusion MRI? Uh, yes, we do have that, but we have not uh, analyzed the uh, diffusion tensor Im imaging data with regard to political ideology. Uh, we still have the, you know, we have the survey questions, right, question uh, answers, we have the uh, DTI data, we could combine them and do something, yeah. That's great. Barry is interested in how self-identified independence might look, uh, particularly given their important role in elections in their um, polarized society. Um, and uh, as well, He's curious about people who change their political identification or their ideological leanings, which we see, I guess, less and less these days. But certainly in past eras of um, partisan sorting, we've seen heavy ways of that. So thoughts on independence or people that might change their ideological disposition over time? Um, just as a quick thought there, um, you know, one might one might think on the Likert scale that somewhere in between could be considered kind of independent or, you know, not or moderate or something along those lines, um, since it's a, I guess it's more of an assessment of kind of how liberal or how conservative do you consider yourself? Um, so that's, that's an interesting, I mean, an interesting thought. So if someone, it wasn't a liquor point, but it could, you know, could be an interesting thing to add there. Um, yeah, I would love to see that, especially in how that contributes or, or differs uh, from the extreme ideology, um, you know, information and associations we found. Uh, for understanding how people change their ideology. I mean, again, I think longitudinal data would just be amazing. Uh, but of course, you know, that's the <laughs> pie in the sky. Like, let's let's just keep recording and getting these nice survey questions. But I think what's really interesting, I mean, just to kind of go back to that though, is the fact that, you know, this data was not particularly collected for the purpose of saying, you know, what how, how does brain data associate with political ideology? So I think, you know, there's a lot of, and it, and it really just comes down to adding some survey questions to fMRI studies, right? So I, I think a really useful thing to do, um, you know, I worked in psychiatry for a little while. I still collaborate with a lot of people in psychiatry as well. I mean, there are so many clinical studies that come out all the time for five to 10 year studies with imaging. Let's just add to that survey questions. Uh, you know what I mean? Like get them, <laughs> like talk to these people, like have more relationships with them to add more survey questions on this. And we can get a really nice, 
longitudinal data set going. I, I think, I, you know, I think that would be really handy to do, to open those communications. Yeah, I should say this was one of the earliest big data set in imaging when we started back in 2012 or 20, yeah, about 2012. But since then, there have been many, many longitudinal studies, uh, large big data set uh, longitudinal studies. As James said, you know, a lot of them don't have political service included, and most of them are focused on drug abuse or, you know, some brain disease and so on and so forth. And I think as a field, political science could probably make a, a point to all these people who are doing brain imaging analysis, I mean, data collection, they should include political biology as part of their studies and so on. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. That we're trying. A lot of <laughs> I want to thank everyone for the questions. I don't think we'll get through all of them, but I think we can maybe get through a couple more. Um, what asked, is there any significant gender differences in the empathy award uh, tasks? Uh, associations between male and female versus those two tasks. Good question. Um, you know, we looked at the associations between that and the actual, hang on, let me go back to that plot. My, my first answer is, I don't believe so. Uh, you know, I, I think we would have certainly put that in there as something, but the, the, the primary um, analyses, I guess, that were in that paper and in that plot that I showed earlier was looking at all that related back to ideology. Um, but I, I don't believe that there were any uh, sex-based differences in, in these tasks. Um, so that's, yeah, uh, that, that's, my, that's my gut answer, but um, I'll come back to that. So if you want to keep going. <laughs> Thank you. I want to um, get to Jared's question. Uh, Jared's asking, is there any work disambigu disambiguating, oh, disambiguating, <laughs> distinguishing ideological extremity from partisan commitments, like being only conservative versus being, you know, a strong Republican? Um, does it seem like you're going to tease apart whether, for example, we were sensitivities associated with stronger ideological or partisan commitments, but I'm wondering if there's any work that has tried to disassociate those two. Uh, I am not aware of any work that's done that with respect to neuropolitics, uh, outside of neuropolitics and just straight political science. Um, yeah, there is a literature that looks at partisan identity versus, um, uh, versus ideology and uh, big literature on in-group, out-group effects and how, how one comes to identify with an in-group um, more around a party than around an ideology. Uh, so yeah, there, there's a lot of work on that um, using sort of political psych style survey experiments um, that, uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's actually a big literature in AP on ideology versus partisanship and what partisanship activates in terms of all these other processes. So that's that, Jared, if you're interested in that. Um, the literature on affective polarization and the work suggesting that uh, people's partisanship ties are more akin to social identities, right? So they derive a great deal of meaning from them that is kind of can be far removed from policy congruence. I think it would be interesting to think about brain activities and brain studies, but for now we're kind of thinking about somebody's work kind of within political science, political psych. Um, I shouldn't be adding to the answers. I should be fielding. <laughs> I'm going to field one last uh, question to you um, so that we can wrap. I'm going to see if I can um, integrate any of these into two. But you have to ask is your brain in, in your brain imaging, is there any area in the brain that um, doesn't seem to align with liberal or conservative um, ideologies? So meaning goes uh, is neutral or isn't it doesn't really I think highlight. so right so kind of maybe suggest someone that doesn't have those ties is maybe more independent or I see so yeah Zonglin uh, I know that was in the in the plot you were looking at with brain regions um, where I'm trying to it seems as though if I remember correctly was the DMN associated with either with either group, I mean, just looking largely at the default mode network, I know we look broke it down into different anatomical uh, pieces, but do you recall? The regions that are not, I, I think many regions are not involved in the prediction. And I would say that 
the, you know, most sensory regions were not involved in this, like auditory, visual, and, you know, and mostly the regions that are involved are in emotion process, emotional processing or decision-making uh, or conflict. It's more like high-level cognitive uh, emotional processing areas are uh, more involved. Yeah, that's a general sense of, of the data. Yeah, to answer the question, uh, possibly I first need to explain what the brain net CNN like works. So brain net CNN and the deconvolutional neural network, they literally detect which brain region or connectome are related to the prediction of the political ideology. So if they cannot find a specific brain region, I mean, then that means that brain region is not related to like a conservative or liberal. So yeah, majority of the brain region might not might not be related to conservatism or liberalism. I think if the brain CNN brain that CNN cannot detect it, then those area or connect them are not related to the prediction of the political ideology. Let me squeeze in one more question because a couple of people asked, and I think it'll be simply answered. Uh, did any of the tasks measure brain flexibility? Or brain ambiguity. Uh, I don't think this task have much to do with flexibility uh, because we're not the task were designed, as I said, mostly to do social emotional processing plus a little bit cognitive. So we were not looking at like flexibility is really uh, cognitive abilities, and th those tasks were not emphasized in this uh, uh, original data collection. Well, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank our audience for such wonderful questions. We got through as many as we could, but I want to thank this wonderful team of researchers for both sharing your work and allowing us to probe a little bit on it. Um, we're so grateful to have you for our quarterly lecture, and I encourage everyone to uh, read the paper to dive deeper into these wonderful contributions. I'm excited about um, not just the kind of conclusions you can draw, but more importantly, right, the questions that are raised by this project and the directions for future study for what I think is such uh, a fertile field. So it's great that you're able to have the resources to do such a large study, such a comprehensive study, and we look forward to seeing what comes next from you individually and collectively. I'm gonna turn it over to Mark for final comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. It's been a real pleasure. Well, as our session comes to a close, I want to again thank our outstanding group of speakers for their presentation today. And thanks to those who have worked so hard behind the scenes to have made this event possible. Stephen Gong, Isabella Caitlin, and Cheryl Cotman from the Center for Neuropolitics, Jessica Banfield from the UCI School of Medicine, and UCI Media Director, Will Alvarez. And thanks to you, our audience, for your engagement. And please don't forget to fill out your evaluation forms. The next event for the UCI Center for Neuropolitics will be on April 19th. Professor Bob Balo from the UCLA Department of Neurology will speak on the Havana Syndrome, a disorder of neuropolitics. Until then, we say goodbye and wish you a safe and enjoyable weekend.